The Dark Wheel by Robert Holmstock. From the moment that the trading ship Avalonia slipped its orbital berth above the planet Lave and began to manoeuvre from the hyperspace jump point, its measurable lifespan, and that of one of its two-man crew, was exactly 18 minutes. The space station gently span away into the shadows and the small Ophidian-class vessel shuddered as its motors angled it round towards the faraway jump. The planet Lave below rotated in blue-green splendour. There were storms moving across the Palubarian Sea. Six great walls of pink and white cloud. They were approaching the continental mass that was first fall and promising a bleak and wet few days to the swathes of forest and the deep snaking valleys that cut through the rugged land. The cities of both humankind and Lavian glittered among the verdant blanket below like bright shards of glass. Watching the lush world from his seat at the astrogation console, Alex Ryder expressed an audible sigh of regret that he had not been allowed down to the world itself. Next to him, fingers moving expertly over the keys of the trader's man-op console, his father grinned. Jason Ryder knew well enough the frustration of only being allowed to observe a rich and fabled world like Lave from orbit. He'd been planetside once, an unforgettable experience. But the rules and regulations of the Galactic Cooperative of Worlds were strict and sensible. Lave, like any other planet, was not a holiday resort, not a curiosity. It was a living, evolving world, and there were folk down below to whom that world was everything that old Earth had once been to the human race. Protection. Mother. Home. Another time, another year, Alex thought. You earned your visit to Lave, and he'd hardly begun his professional life. He still had so much to learn. The Riders had been a trading family for three generations. It had begun with Ben Ryder, who had traded almost exclusively using shot-up pirate ships. Ben had lived life on the edge, and one day, one night, one star year, he had not returned. Out in the void, between the stars, his grave was as remote as it was private, and would probably never be found. His son, and his grandson, who was Jason Ryder, had followed the family business. Alex would soon have to make the final decision, whether to sacrifice his life to shuttling cargo between the worlds of the Galactic Cooperative, or to train for a different profession. Let's be clearer about trading. Trading between worlds is no game for a youngster with ideas of getting rich quick. You can spend a lifetime carrying food, machinery and textiles, and at the end of that life you'll have saved up enough to buy a patch of coastal land on an Earth-type world, spend the rest of your days in quiet, isolated comfort. That's all. A lifetime of sweat and combat for an orbital shuttle, a home and the clear blue of an alien sea at your doorstep. If you want more, there are ways of getting it. Narcotics, slaves, zoo animals, weapons, political refugees, trade in any of these things and wealth will tumble around you. And corsairs. And privateers. And pirates. And the police. The strain of the years of honest trading was already telling on Jason Ryder, but he'd invested wisely, and this small cargo-carrying pleasure yacht was his pride and joy. He could get away from the trade lanes for a while, though he always respected the trader maxim that an empty hold means an empty head, and never travelled freightless. Today, he was carrying thrump berry juice, an exotic flavouring. He could show his son what space was really like and wet the lad's appetite, or let him see that a life in a hard vacuum was one of the hardest lives of all. For his part, Alex Ryder would need a lot more convincing. He was a tall, fair-haired young man, wiry and athletic. He was Atmo surfing champion on the Ryder's homeworld, Ontiat, and very bright. Like all young men of his age, he was reluctant to switch his status from that of student to professional. With all that meant, in terms of settling with one particular girl, one job, and beginning to plan for when, eventually, he would buy his own land. 
he still had a year to decide. A year of surfing, freefall baseball, cloud barbecues, high falling partner selection and sim combat. He was in no hurry, except that he loved space. Loved the flash of sun on the duralium hulls, the clutter and confusion of the spaceports. Loved the idea of other worlds, of exploration, of pathfinding. The voice of Syscom, which controlled all traffic flow in Lave's orbit space, murmured softly, Avalonia, make a four-minute drift flight to faraway jump point. Understood, Alex called back and adjusted the audio accordingly. His father sat back and smiled, his job done for the moment. Siscon said, Enter faraway jump along channel 27 at 45 Orient. Affirmed, Alex said, and his father rolled the ship along its central axis, ready for the dangerous hyperspace transit. Everything looked good. On the rear monitor, where the planet shone brilliantly as it slowly moved through the heavens, a dark shadow drifted into vision, another ship lining up for the faraway jump. It was quite normal, Alex took no notice, more concerned about the impending transit through hyperspace. His father scrutinised the other vessel for a moment, then relaxed. He had no way of knowing that he had only 14 minutes left alive. Making a faraway jump in a system as complex and crowded as Lave is no simple business. A hundred eyes are watching you for the slightest mistake. Make a mistake in orbit space, and the next time you go to dock at one of the world's Coriolis space stations, a big not welcome sign might flash in the vacuum before you. You slip your sea berth under the instruction of Station Space Monitor. Perhaps 20 ships are doing the same. You go when it's safe. You rotate accelerate, decelerate and spin to the absolute second, both of time and arc. That way you get clear without 2,000 tonnes of duralium trader rammed into your hyperspace jets. It isn't over. Now you're under the supervision of HSA, Home Space Authority, and they'll jockey you safely about among the traders and the yachts and the ferries and the shuttles and the starliners and the three arrow-shaped space patrol ships. All of these vessels slip and slide about you. Streaks of silver in the darkness, flashing green and blue lights, sudden walls of grey metal that pass over your bows, winking yellow warning beacons. You move through all this chaos and a new voice begins to call for attention. Now you with the faraway orientation systems controller, FOSC or SISCOM, sets you up for the big jump. You're going to cover maybe seven light years in a few minutes, and you might think that's a lot of space to get lost in. But that isn't how it works. Far away is a tunnel, like any other tunnel. Inside that tunnel is the realm called Witch Space. A magic place. A place where the normal rules of the universe don't necessarily work. And every few thousand parsecs along the Witch Space tunnel, there are monitoring satellites and branch lines and stop points and rescue stations. And passing by all of these are perhaps a hundred channels, a hundred lines for ships to travel, one each one protected against the two big dangers of hyperspace travel, atomic reorganisation and time displacement. Jump on your own through hyperspace across more than half a light year and you'll be lucky to make the same universe, let alone your destination. You might emerge from which base, turn inside out, which is not a pretty sight. You might be stretched in all the wrong angles and although the ship keeps travelling, all that jelly mass of broken bone and flesh inside the cabin is you. According to legend, you might come through okay and breathe a sigh of relief only to go into Earth orbit and wonder why that big lizard with the teeth and the long tail and the green scales is roaring up at you and warning you off his nice Jurassic patch of prehistoric desert. To go far away is a killer unless you obey the rules. So, for a few minutes on that fateful day, Alex Ryder was content to let the robot voices of Siscon guide his family's ship through the space lanes towards the jump point for the planet Leasty. He relaxed beside his father and watched the bustle of the spaceport. The shadow behind them, the ship that was following their path towards Faraway, was a Cobra-class cargo freighter. No one knew how or when the designation of space-going vessels had been linked to the names of snakes, 
The rider's own vessel was a relatively harmless ophidian, capable of two hyperspace jumps, armed very basically, set up really only to destroy imminent dangers like asteroids, meteoroids or crazy crafts. The name given to vessels that were out of control or ridden by juveniles out for kicks. The Cobra was a bigger vessel by far. A common trading ship, most Cobras are buried beneath the weaponry and defences that the hard-bitten, tough-talking captains have accrued. And with good reason. To be a trader is to be two things, dangerous and at risk. Dangerous because to survive as a trader you have to know your weapons and how to use them in space combat. You need to be able to recognise a pirate or an anarchist or a Thargoid invader or a police trap when you might be carrying any one of the thousands of prohibited materials. And at risk for the same reason, juicy cobra weighed down with minerals or rare textiles or furs or oil is as tasty a target for a freebooter as any in the galaxy. To be a trader means to shoot first and pray that you've read the warning signs all right and that your victim was a pirate. Make a mistake and not even two shells of time-stressed your allium and a belly full of missiles is going to save you from the Vipers. Vipers. Police ships. Small, fast, deadly and most particularly tenacious. The pilot is a man, certainly, but kill the man and the ship will keep coming at you. Kill the ship and its missile will keep coming at you. Kill the missile and watch for the shadow. When a viper bites, it clings. 11 minutes. There's a sign you'll not often see. His father's words broke through Alex's silent, concentrated study of the planet they were leaving. To the right, running a parallel course towards the faraway tunnel, was an odd-shaped ship with powerful lights flickering on and off. It was catching the sun and Alex could see how it was slowly spinning about its central axis. Fish-like fins opened and closed. Across its sleek hull, a rapid pattern of coloured lights rippled. A moray. A sub-aqua vessel, designed for both space and undersea voyaging. The moray was a rare ship indeed to see in space, especially about to undertake a hyperspace transit. On worlds like Rajiti and Aona, where the only land was the tips of volcanoes rising from oceans, the Moray was both freighter and public transport. A vital ship link between the undersea cities that were developing in such hostile environments. The Moray's frantic colour signalling ceased. Alex noticed that his father was watching the animalistic display. The coding had been developed from the signalling of a terrestrial aquatic creature, the squid, with a frown on his face. Something up? Jason shrugged, not sure. Probably not. Alex watched the moray with renewed interest and then turned back the rear view where the cobra had nudged a few kilometres closer. Shall we warn him to stay back? Jason shook his head. For the first time, Alex realised that his father had been as aware of the trader as he and had been studying it curiously for some minutes. There was tension on the Avalonius Bridge that was unusual and unpleasant. Something wasn't right. Alex had no idea what, but he sensed it powerfully. Something was not going according to routine. Then the go signal for entry to the faraway tunnel flashed on, accompanied by a gentle audio prompt. Bing bong. And as it did so, the Avalonia's life expectancy had shrunk to just nine minutes. Around the entry point to which space is always to be found, the biggest cluster of transit vessels. Most of them moored in groups at orbital buoys, while mechanics and repairmen crawl over them, checking and servicing their external systems. At such a point, in any advanced system like Lave, you'll see every ship of the line, every type, subtype and artificially mocked up version of every snake ship ever built. As they approach the jump, Alex practiced ship identification, a crucial talent in any spacefaring profession. The unarmed, unmanned orbit shuttles were easy enough to spot as they ferried cargo all around the system. He noticed two ASPs, Navy ships, small, manoeuvrable and deadly, well protected against attack and with highly advanced military weapons systems. He saw a single crate, the so-called Star Striker, 
a small one-man ship much favoured by pathfinders and mercenaries. To his right, space docked and still unloading her passengers, was the immense cylindrical mass of an anaconda, a massive freighter that had been adapted to passenger transport. It was an ugly ship, and its yawning space ram gave the appearance of it being a squat, blind creature with its mouth disgustingly agape. The catalogue was endless, boa-class cruisers, pythons, the bounty hunter's favourite, the Ferdelance, packed out with weapons and no doubt decked out inside like a palace. Landing craft called worms, mambas, sidewinders, large craft and small, all winking brightly, reflecting sunlight in brilliant blue-grey sheens. And of course, there were advertising droid ships, their catchy light displays, blinking out information about Rohan's real earth ale with honey, or Kettle's clone your own fungal cures, even offering the last real food before witch space. Small restaurant ships designed to dock and supply instant nourishment, priests' perfect protopolyps, Tuttle's tasty therapsa bladders to space weary travellers. Here we go, hang on to your seat. Jason Ryder always said this, and Alex always fell for it. He tensed up as if the ship was about to plunge over a gravity roller. In fact, the entry to which space was accompanied by an almost negligible accelerative surge, a moment's dizziness, and then the spectacular sight of the stars brightening, spreading out and suddenly streaking in multicoloured circular patterns, so the ship seemed to be passing down a spinning tube. Almost as soon as the surge of acceleration had come, it had gone. The ship drifted in which light, in the non-place, in space and time. It was crossing the void between stars in seconds, but for those seconds it was in a twilight world whose existence was beyond imagination. They say that witch space is haunted. Maybe that's why they call it witch. Time turns all around and atoms turn inside out and gravity waves billow up and things move there. Life forms, or shadows, or atoms, or galaxies. Who knows? No one has ever stopped and gone outside to find out. Only robot remotes exist there. Switching stations, monitors, rescue droids, and the like. Whatever lives in which space, in the faraway tunnels, will remain a mystery, always. But there are ghosts there. The ghosts of the early ships that went into faraway, and didn't come out again. Ghosts and shadows. The shadow of a snake, a cobra rising over them. What in God's name? Jason Ryder had gone whiter than white light. Trapped in witch space, there was nothing he could do to outmanoeuvre the other vessel. Alex said, he doesn't know the rules, perhaps it's a rookie pilot. Perhaps, his father said. Jason Ryder's eyes never left the scanners. His father had beaded with sweat. Alex watched the shadow of the Cobra, well equipped. A fuel scoop, missile silos, extra cargo holds, the squat dome of an energy bomb housing. A rich ship indeed, and a deadly one. They can't be intending to attack us. <laughs> the hell they can't. Three minutes. And they came out of which space? Immediately, Jason's hands began to fly over the key console. The Avalonia surged forwards, rotating on its long axis. The planet Leasty was a small greenish disk in the far distance. Alex saw his father arm the two missiles that the Avalonia carried and then reached out to rest his hand on the multiple laser trigger. It was a pirate then. And as Alex came to accept the inevitability of combat, his mouth went dry and his mind sharpened. He'd never been in combat before, not for real only in the sim trainer. He'd heard his father talk about it, of course. Combat did not sound glorious. A pirate ship, disguised as a trader, pursuing its victim into which space itself for their cargo of... Thrumpberry flavouring? An uneasy voice whispered in Alex's mind. This was untypical behaviour for a freebooter. They normally waited at the edge of planetary systems, watching for their prey with long-distance scanners, picking and choosing carefully. Pirates could be found everywhere, of course, although rarely in space around corporate state worlds or democracies. The police were too efficient. Planets run by anarchistic or feudal governments were a pirate's favourite haunt. This behaviour 
was wrong. Not a pirate. Alex looked from the slowly rotating planet to the grim, grey features of his father. They were a long way from safety. What the hell are we up against? Put on a remlock. Get to the escape pod, Jason Ryder murmured. Do it. I'll stay and fight. The hell you will. Do as I say. As he spoke, Jason thrust a small black face mask, the remote space locator, at his son. The first missile struck the Avalonia's shields and Jason punched the launch buttons on his own defences. The small ship veered and strained as he looped it in an escape run, activating his ECM as the Cobra launched a second wave of missiles. The rear screen exploded with light. But through the brightness, the sombre grey shape of the killer came on. It happened so fast then that afterwards Alex was uncertain as to what exactly had happened. The duelling ships span and circled in towards the planet. Space around them blazed silently as their weapons struck and were deflected. Then the whole universe rocked. Air screeched into the void. The lights on the Avalonia blinked and dimmed. Warning lights shot on across the console. Laser temperature in the red. Screens down. Energy low. Cargo jettisoned. Cabin temperature dropping. In the same moment of the Avalonia's death, Alex Ryder found himself being struck by his father, the Remlock mask forced into place around his eyes, nose and mouth, and his whole body was physically manhandled into the escape pod. The ship shuddered and screamed. Fuel spilled into the void. Father and son faced each other for a last moment, each watching the other through a mist of tears and confusion. I, I don't understand, Alex screamed above the noise of the dying ship, meaning who's trying to kill us. Raxler, Jason said. Remember, Raxler. Then, as he pushed Alex back into the cramped escape pod, he shouted, Remember me, Alex. I, I wouldn't have wished this on you. Raxler. The escape pod was jettisoned. Alex tumbled. The sleek shape of the Avalonia was above him. Then, just white light. White heat. Cold space. In a second, it had gone. The ship, his father, part of his life, obliterated by a single burst of fire from the hovering shape of the pirate. And, as Alex watched, so a yellow tongue of fire licked towards the tumbling escape pod. He felt heat, then pain, then cold. The tiny survival vehicle was blasted apart, sparkling fragments falling towards the green world of Leasty. Alex hit space, arms flailing, mouth open, consciousness and life draining from him with every second. In space, everyone can hear you scream. As long, that is, as you're equipped with a Remlock survival mask. An instant after Alex Ryder hit the hard vacuum, a skin of plus fibre had been shot across his body from nozzles on the facepiece, keeping him warm against the cold, tightening and protecting him, securing him against the void. The oxygen flow in his body was cut off to all but his heart and brain. Needle doses of adrenaline and somnuki were held ready just within the skin area of his mouth, ready to alert or depress his bodily functions according to circumstances. And the Remlock screamed through space for help. It was a standard survival device, an instantly recognisable distress call, indicating that it was being sent out from a small, remotely located, dying body. The alarm screeched out on 40 channels, shifting wavelength within each channel four times a second, 120 chances to catch attention. A cumbersome Boa-class cruiser, loaded down with industrial machinery, slowed its departure run from Leasty and turned to scan space for the source of the signal. Two police vipers came streaking from their patrol sector near the sun, scanning for the body in trouble. An adapted Moray starboat, vast glowing yellow star on its hull, the sign of a hospital ship, came chugging out of the darkness. Messages from ships to both the planet and its ring of Coriolis stations were abruptly broken as the split-second message came screaming through. TV programmes were interrupted, the screen dissolving into a permanently recorded display of the space grid location of the Remlock. 
Every advertising space module changed its garish display to flash in brilliant green the same information. In the orbit space around Liste, a million heads turned starwards. That split second of panic, that moment's cry of distress, was a sound they knew too well to ignore and were too frightened of to take for granted. Within 20 seconds, two auto-remotes, tiny vessels just big enough to carry an hour's oxygen, one dose each of 40 drugs and a variety of other stimulants, were hovering around Alex Ryder's spinning body. One of them shot out a stabilising cable and dragged itself to his corpse. Blinking through its solitary monitor, it hovered over his face like a squat, legless dachshund hound and pumped adrenaline, oxygen and glucose into his bloodstream. Alex opened his eyes and panicked slightly. The auto-remote calmed him down with a quick bump surge of tet vow. The robot's voice whispered in his ears, Brandy, scotch, vodka, I am equipped with a full range of miniature stimulants to make the waiting easier. What, what happened? Ship! Avalonia! He gasped through the tight face mask. The auto-remote blinked at him sympathetically, Brandy then, and hit Alex with two shots of Quaterian Sin Cognac. An hour later, he was aboard the Moray Hospital vessel, in parked orbit above the green-grey face of the world of Leasty. Burns to his hand and face had been taken care of. Minor blood vessels that had ruptured in his skin had been knitted back together. He was bruised, stunned, but essentially fit physically. The image of the ship exploding had begun to haunt him, however. He stood by the wide, sloping window of his hospital room, staring out across the brightness of space to the slowly rotating world below watching the flash and tumble of shuttles, small freighters, as they either glided up from world down or struck the atmosphere on their descent, leaving brief, brilliant flares of red in the thin planetary atmosphere. Wherever he looked, he could see the shadow of the cobra rising up in the witchlight, a great killer beast closing on its prey and his father's face. The sudden alarm, the sudden anger, and yet, and yet Jason Ryder had known his grieving, mind-stunned son just knew that his father had been more aware of the danger than he'd let on. It had been in his face, in the tension in the cabin, in the slow, deliberate words that he'd spoken during the approach run to hyperspace. Jason had known that his life was in danger. He'd been ready for it, ready to save his son in the event of attack. It made no sense. But for the moment, Alex only felt loss. Loss of a man he loved. Both his parents were gone now. His home world would seem an empty, uninviting place. Behind him, the door opened softly, and the grey-suited figure of a nurse appeared. She reproved him mildly for being out of bed, but seemed pleased by his apparently calm mental state. There followed what seemed like a constant stream of visitors, first the doctor scanning him for tension and psychic repression. The medic was not pleased, more or less said. Mo not pleased, he more or less said, Young man, your father's dead. It would do you no harm to shed a few tears. It's all there, all the grief, all the sadness, do no good to deny it. I'll grieve for my father, Alex said back, angrily, coldly. I'll grieve for him amongst the ashes of the pirate that killed him, and not until. Will you indeed? Yes, Alex stated defiantly. I will, indeed. After the doctor had gone, the man from the Galactic Medical Cooperative came, fussily checking up on Alex's medical insurance, making sure that he was covered for all aspects of the treatment, including his faraway transit home. Then the police, two lean-faced men wearing the grey cloaks and silver waistcoats of the Narcotics Investigation Department. What cargo had the Avalonia been carrying? Why would a pirate be so interested in him as to follow him to a corporate state world? Had his father ever transported drugs? Firearms? Slaves? What about alien substances? Manjusa fear glands? Mars wort? What was said in the moments before destruction? Would he recognise the ship again? What were his markings? Alex told them everything he could remember, everything he'd seen, everything he'd heard, except for the fact that his father had clearly known the danger. And except for the word Raxler. The police left. They were not satisfied. Alex had just received his solo pilot's licence. So he could make his own way back to his home system, but he should notify them of what route he was taking. Raxler. Alex watched them go, their viper a slim, evil-looking ship, as it rolled and sped away from the hospital vessel. His mood matched the dim-lit room, 
matched the gloom grey of the storms that were building up on the world below. Leasty's oceans looked wild and cold now. Its clouds great charcoal-coloured swirls of anger above the ragged mountainous land. Raxler. What could it be? What could it mean? At midnight, still resting and recuperating, care of the Leasty Medical Authority, a small green light winked on in his room. Alex, still awake, frowned and then realised he was being monitored. What is it? He asked the empty room, and a nurse's voice whispered, There's a hollow fact message coming through for you. They've requested a tight beam. Will you receive? Alex sat up in bed. No one he knew was here, did they? He frowned and said, Sure. Will you accept the charge against your CR? Curiouser and curiouser. Since he was broke and without credit until he sorted out his GMC insurance, it was easy for him to say yes. In the middle of the room, the air suddenly shimmered white, small particles flying off in all directions around the gradually defined shape of a man. He was tall but slightly stooped. As the whiteness of the image resolved into colour, the whiteness of the man stayed. His hair was long and snowy, his beard ragged, his face had a touch of colour, his eyes were small gleaming points amongst the wrinkles. He was smiling. He wore a tattered trader's uniform and one arm hung limp by his side. Even his boots were worn down and the toes were split. The hand laser at his side had seen the same better days as the rest of his equipment. You the rider boy? This apparition of run-down age asked. The voice creaked, a gruff, battered tone. The voice of a man who'd breathed hard vacuum. That's me, Alex Ryder. And you? Alex climbed out of bed and went to stand before the life-sized hollow fac. The old man watched him and chewed. And then he spat. The gobbet of stained spittle seemed to fly straight towards Alex's shoulder and he winced and jerked slightly to one side, before realising that nothing could travel into real space from the hollow. You don't remember me, the old man said. That's clear enough, but I remember you. Give me a name. Raf Zetter, trader of old. Traded with your father for many years till we parted company on account of a certain issue which you might say caused a difference of opinion between us. Slaves, Alex said quickly. He remembered Raf now. But what happened to the man? He was old before his time. He was the same age as Jason Ryder would have been, but it looked twenty years more. Slaves is right, Raff said. I ran my life on the edge of a viper's sting. Trader parlance for one jump ahead of the law. But by the time I indulged that little whim, my ass was hard iron. I somehow made it to hell and back. That's where I am now. In hell? Broke. Alex nodded, picking up slowly on the trader slang. An iron ass was a ship that was well enough defended, shields, missiles and lasers, to make a skim run through any system at all, even an anarchist's paradise like Satique. All hell and then some would come at you if you tried to trade in such a chaotic system. Hell and back meant that Raff had tasted the good life, bought with the profits of his illegal trading. But that it had all gone wrong. It always went wrong. Raff said, I was damn sorry to hear about Jason, a good man, a good friend of old, a man I still respect. He didn't happen but eight hours ago, Alex said coldly. How the hell you get to hear about it? Raff Setter chuckled, then spat again, and again Alex couldn't help ducking. The spittle vanished at the hollow fact's edge and Alex felt a chill of irritation. You got your father's temper, young Alex. Maybe you've even got some of his skills. Answer my question, old man. How do you manage to know about my father? What do you even... How did you even... How did you find me? Watching him from the hollow, Raff chewed, smiled and considered. Alex tensed, waiting for the next high-velocity spit transmission. Raff said, I repeat, Alex, I had great respect for Jason Ryder, for what he was and what he was doing. He was a good man, Alex said, and an honest trader. He was a damn sight more than that, Raff said loudly and spat. Alex dodged. The ghostly hollow fac image shimmered and blurred slightly. What does that mean? Raff Zetter, 
leaned forward so that his grizzled features seemed almost able to kiss the younger man. He was a combatier, Alex, one of the best. No way should he have died like he did. My father was a trader, not a combatier, Alex said, startled and disturbed by what Raff was implying. Guess again, Sonny. But it sickened him to fire shots in anger. Maybe, Raff said dryly, but it didn't stop him. How else do you think he made it as a trader all these years? Damn it, Alex, even if your cargo is sour cream and pickles, there's someone's going to try and take it from you. Your father was a combatier of the highest calibre. Alex swallowed heavily, staring at the quizzical features of old Raff Zeta. The highest calibre? Raff nodded. That's right, Alex, he said softly. You can be deadly, you can be dangerous, and you can end up as pet food in orbit around a dog's ass of a world like his baby. But if you're elite and you die, then there's a reason for your death. What was this old man saying? Elite? An elite combatier? Alex's head span. He knew all about the space pilots who'd earned that title, of course. Few of them did. To be elite in combat was to be, well, as near as invincible as made no odds. A great many pilots were dangerous. You didn't last long as a trader if you weren't. Many more had earned the classification deadly. So had a lot of mercenaries. So had a lot of pirates. But elites? Few and far between. And his father? Jason Ryder had been elite and none of his family had known. Jason was one of the very best. You probably never saw his ship, but it was like a fortress. He traded places that most of us would have had nightmares about. Raff shook his head admiringly. One of the best, a man of the highest caliber. His gaze hardened on Alex. The question is, can you be the same? What makes you doubt it? Jason never said anything about you. I guess he was trying to protect you. Trouble is, it gives me nothing to go on. You're going to avenge your father's death. I can tell that from the look of you, and from your tone and your anger. For all I know, that'll just mean one more rider will be stardust before he even manages to target a missile. Not liking Rafzetta's tone, Alex said bitterly, I've done hours of sim combat. I score highly. Raf laughed and spat voluminously, then became serious. Alex, there's something I've got to know. Maybe you're going to end up pet food in orbit round his baby? Yeah, maybe that. The only person who knew your talents was your father. Tell me, Alex. Tell me true now. Did he say anything to you? You know, in the moments before he died, did he uh, indicate anything or say anything? He said a lot, Alex murmured, and he felt a strong pang of grief as he remembered the look in his father's eyes, the greyness of his cheeks and his desperate words, remember me, Alex. I think he knew he was going to die. The last thing he said was the word Raxler. I don't know what that is. An alien, I guess, Raff smiled, shaking his head. Suddenly, there was a brilliant sparkle in his eyes. Raxler's no alien, Alex. It's a ghost world, a planet, a legend. He hesitated, staring quizzically at the younger man with the distant link between them. Jason really said that to you? Alex nodded moments before. It was the last thing he said. Then he knew, Raff said with a nod. But that's good enough for me, Alex. Get your frail shell to Tyanisla. Take a visitor's shuttle to the orbital cemetery there. Say you've come to see the grave of star pilot Fleischer. Take a good look around. You do that, boy. Tomorrow, I'll be waiting for you. Waiting to do what? Raff chuckled. How are you going to hunt a cobra? You going to hitchhike? Or use a big stick. You'll need a ship. Hunt like with like. Get to the wreck place at Tyanisla. I know just the vehicle you need. Don't speak to anyone. Just get to Tyanisla. But 
Au revoir, Alex. And Raph Setter spat for the last time before the hollow fact faded. Alex didn't flinch. Something whistled past his ear and struck the wall behind him. Thank you.